Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives find themselves in new positions of power and influence. Lawmakers is next. Lawmakers is brought to you in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Lawmakers. I'm Mark McDonald. Well, they say that elections have consequences, and we're about to see just how those consequences play out in the U.S. House specifically, because that's the one, Representative John Shimkus, where we saw the sea change of positions from Democrat right. to Republican. And now you find yourself and your party in the majority. Right. It's, it's amazing. Been, it's been, uh, what, f at least four years since yeah, your party it, was in the uh, ma and just majority. Kind of to mention that, I think, and you hear even even Vice President Biden said, there, there's always times when people think, okay, now this party's out of power for the next decade or 20 years, and then. Mm -hmm. You can't Whoa. predict. You, can't you cannot predict. You, predict. You cannot predict. There are too many ingredients right. in the American fabric right. to be able to predict what's going to happen. Right. The economy and all the uh, the world tensions and everything that go on. But specifically for you, you've been in now. Is this your eighth eighth term? Starting my eighth. You're starting your yeah. eighth term. Um, you see your life go up and down depending on on which party is in power. Now, how will your life change? Well, I'm I'm not uh, the big fish in the pond, but I'm not the minnow. <laughs> I'm not the, the freshman. There's there's 87 new freshman members in, in the Republican side of the House, and there's nine Democrats. And there's a sea change of just mm -hmm. new person personalities. But for me, I'm kind of in the middle. Um, I'm a subcommittee chairman now, so I have responsibilities uh, that f cause me to focus on those areas. Um, I still s will be serving on the other committees that I love, which is energy and healthcare and telecommunications. So I've, I've landed on my feet uh, uh, with a lot of work to do in Washington. I think when you're uh, in a, kind of in the middle of the pack, uh, you're, you will be uh, approached by, especially out of the freshmen from the, uh, not just from Illinois, but I'm a, a regional rep. so. These guys are coming and talk to me for advice from mm -hmm. Illinois, uh, Missouri, and, and Arkansas is, is the region that I try to help represent. And there's just a, a boatload of there's <laughs> a lot of, well, There's a lot of orientation to be done, right? I mean, because right. these guys, if it were me and, and I were just coming in there, I'd look for somebody like yourself who could say, where's the restroom? You know, I mean, what do I do next? Where right. do I go? Who do I and, talk to? And most of this class really have no political experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, these are folks who, were so fed up with the direction of the national government. They were small business uh, men, uh, military folks who had recently retired, um, and so they got engaged. Uh, you know, I think like a lot of us, wanting to fight the good fight, but not really thinking that you, you can get over the happen. hurdle. Yeah. And so now yeah. they're there, and boy, holy cow, we've yeah. got to go to work. Yeah. Now, in your own in your own position, you were on the Energy and Commerce Committee before. Right. Um, and, and you love that work. I know that uh, yeah. you've been on this show before, and you've told us right. that that's a right. committee that you really enjoy. Now you have a chair of a subcommittee of that committee. Correct. What is the name of that subcommittee? It's called the Environment and the Economy. We want to We want to continue to focus on jobs and job creation and how what we do may help or what we do may hurt in job creation. In fact, Illinois is really focusing, trying, I mean, with all things that are going on in Illinois. Um, so, but the, the specific areas in the environment that I deal with, because I don't have the whole environment portfolio, is, is solid waste, you know, in essence, landfill. Mm -hmm. um, uh, nuclear waste, big issue. If you're going to expand nuclear power, what do you do with the high-level nuclear waste? And there's a funding issue, and rates go into mm -hmm. to, to offset some of that. Um, I'll have the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, so the question is, how clean is clean? What is acceptable for the health of human individuals? And are we raising the standards so high that it's not cost-effective to continue to deploy clean water out to areas that still don't have water. Um, we'll have uh, 
uh, issues that deal with, like coal ash is a, is, is a big issue. So clean, coal state. clean energy, would it, you'd be involved in clean uh, energy? The, the energy portfolio is in another okay. subcommittee, but I'm, I'm basically uh, chairman of the trash mm -hmm. committee. Mm -hmm. It's a, a trash committee, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're on the right end of it anyway. Um, but, but you will be the one that determines which, you and your, your, and your committee chair will be the ones that determine which bills come before your committee to be heard, I guess. Right. Um, you know, we've been going through meetings, and we just formally organized the committee yesterday, which means uh, now we can really start to work. And a lot of us wanted to go right after the swearing in of three mm -hmm. weeks ago, but yeah. the, uh, the, uh, uh, now he's ranking member Waxman, had to assign his subcommittee uh, ranking members, and they had to put their Democrats on the committee. And so we did the f formal process to say, okay, it's, it's time to start. So then next week you'll start seeing le legislative hearings and, and markups. And, and the reality is this. I mean, there's, there's issues that, I, I, and I've, in my short time I've already found out that there's issues that business, and job creators are concerned about because Democrats were in the control and they think they're doing a good job but of course it's never good enough for some folks and so the rules and regulations were going to piled on that would affect expansion job creation or maybe a dec decision to move overseas much like the state and mm -hmm. in, in income tax you know when is too much and when will people opt to move um, now we're in control so the question is do we have to have the same type of hearings Mm -hmm. Or are things okay the way they are as long as the health and welfare and the safety of the public is, is maintained? Mm -hmm. And so we've got to sort through a change in mentality about what was an important issue in the last Congress versus what's an important issue now. Right. And I assume that what happened was there was probably a backlog of legislation that didn't get acted on. And I, right. I guess you look at that and say, toss that, toss that, here's a good one, toss that, toss well, that, and work your way Here's a good that. example. One of the issues of the portfolio that I have is chemical plant security. Now, the, 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 in this chemical, we're, not, we're talking about plastic folks, anyone who does this chemicals to make goods and products and okay. services. Because of September 11th and um, security issues, uh, the, the industry and uh, Homeland Security folks says we need a national rules and regulations for security, perimeters, uh, fencing, uh, for all the right reasons. And, and they, in essence, said national standards will help us more than state standards because we want to be able to have one standard and we meet that standard, then we're good, instead of 50 different mm -hmm. standards for the issues. Well, in the last Congress, then the, the Democrats pushed the envelope a little bit further and they used a terminology called inherently safer technologies, which really changed the dynamics about capital investment and billion, millions of dollars of changes to plants, not just fencing and guards and stuff like that. So in essence, that's a bill that still needs to be addressed because mm -hmm. the reauthorization is ending. Is it one that we move to their level of this whole debate of inherently safer technologies, or do we just address the security situations and a national piece of legislation so that everyone can say, okay, at least that was done? Mm -hmm. That's an example mm -hmm. of uh, something that's been held over that we could probably take up and do yeah. pretty quick, mm -hmm. at least on the House side. Now, I, this may not be your area of expertise, but since you are on the energy and commerce committee, right. uh, everybody is talking about gas prices. Right. Everybody. And and every administration has had to deal with this at some point because they always spike. Right. And they're at three now. They're, people are going to go to four. They're going to go to five. By next summer, they're going to be at seven. <sighs> What's the deal? <laughs> the deal is if we want low gas prices, we have to have more supply. I mean, I love this question because it just drives me nuts. Um, if we continue to send signals that uh, uh, or rely on imported crude oil to, to develop our refined product, then we're always going to we're always going to be held hostage to the price of a barrel of crude oil. So in the energy portfolio that we have, and, and really you break in, I always break energy into electricity and liquid transportation fuels. And that's what the way the public has to think. We are independent on electricity generation. We are highly reliant on imported crude oil for our transportation fuels. Mm -hmm. So let's expand the electricity generation portfolio, and let's use what we have available within the North American continent, that'd be Mexico and also Canada, to expand the commodity crude oil. 
or the commodity product to make liquid fuels. Coal, you can turn coal into liquid fuels. Your shale oil from mm -hmm. Canada, you can turn into liquid fuels. You, natural gas, we got all these huge natural gas finds. That could go into electricity, but it also could be turned into liquid fuel. Until we have a national energy plan that is an all the above uh, strategy that diversifies our portfolio and allows, what we want to do is we want these energy resources to compete for our purchase. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's no competition. We're trying to with ethanol, and uh, uh, but it's it's net it could, ethanol where it's helpful, decreasing our reliance on imported crude oil. It's highly under attack. Uh, it's never going to be enough to replace the whole liquid fuel uh, need. So we need these other things, and in the American system, let them compete at the pump. Can you imagine driving up to a fueling station, not a gas station, and then you have the opportunity to choose. Uh, what type of liquid fuel to put in your car that's going to compete? E85, uh, liquid gas by natural gas, liquid gas by coal, uh, liquid gas by crude oil. And, and then you decide based upon the pricing mm -hmm. on the sign or the miles per gallon. Let the consumer get control of this. Let's not be held captive to the imports of crude oil. You then, and people that think the way you do on this, need to be, need to be uh, somehow uh, convincing others that you want to drill more oil here yeah, in the I U.S., know, know. off the coast, in Canada, e import from Mexico and Canada. This administration, with their stopping the uh, recovery and exploration of oil and gas off in, in the Gulf, is killing us. Just killing us. Will your Energy and Commerce Committee come up with, you, you said we need an energy policy. Will you develop that? Well, I think, uh, I think the public, and you're a great observer of the public, they're not into big pieces of legislation right now. They're into small, precise, understandable things that we can be held accountable for. So, I, no, I, I don't think you're going to see a comprehensive energy plan. But... Can, will you see something on, uh, for me, again, if I'm expanding all the above strategy and I'm going to incentivize the expansion of nuclear power, what I can do in my little portfolio is start addressing what you do with high-level nuclear waste. Because right now, high-level nuclear waste is stored on site. Mm -hmm. Clinton, it's right there. Right. Look at all the facilities we have in the Chicagoland. Where is the high-level nuclear waste? Suburbia, Chicagoland. I, why not put it where we really wanted it to go, which is in a mountain underneath a desert in, in you know where, mm -hmm. Nevada. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's part of that debate because then you send a signal to the industry, you know, we're going we're gonna to keep our promise and we're going to deal with the high level of nuclear waste because uh, we've allowed you and we forced ratepayers to pay to take this stuff. Now we have to pay the utilities to hold their own waste. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, which drives the cost up, of course. Which drives the cost up. Um, the health care bill, uh, which passed in the spring of last year, I think it was the spring of last year, yeah. uh, had, a, had a rough summer, a lot of contention. Uh, 26 to 27, including Oklahoma now, have filed lawsuits against the federal government to keep it from going into, into action. The House has voted to repeal it. I assume you voted to repeal I, it. I did. Um, and, and part of the reasons was it was called by the Republicans a job-killing or job-destroying bill. In, it, what jobs are we looking at that would be destroyed by the health care bill? Yeah, it, the whole debate is why um, there's no debate that there is capital on the sidelines that's not being used by corporate America to expand and grow. They are retrenched right now. So you have to ask them, why? You know, what's causing you not to jump back into the hiring? And they'll tell you a couple things. In Illinois, they'll tell you a few more. <laughs> but most of the country will say uncertainty. Uncertainty. Uncertainty in energy prices because we really don't have a handle on, on uh, energy costs. Mm -hmm. And they're afraid that we'll do a cap and trade and raise mm -hmm. energy costs. And they'll, uncertainty on health care and health care benefits and costs. Everyone who went back as a big company that provides health insurance to their employees, guess what they got in December? They, they went back into negotiations, and what did they get? They got higher costs for their employees and less benefits. Why? This health care law. Mm -hmm. So the job-destroying aspect is it's 
there's uncertainty and there's no desire to bring on more people because it costs more, especially if you're keeping the same health care benefit package. I mean, I bet you could check here, the benefits package here. I don't know what they, you know, and remember, most people don't even know. And um, they know what they're paying, yeah. but they don't know the overall package. They may know what's covered and what's not covered. I bet most people are going to see higher individual cost and less benefits in any insurance package. So that's where that comes from. It comes from, uh, and then you, you look at National Association of Manufacturers, NFIB, they try to crunch some numbers and see how that'll affect, and that's why they go on, on, on the floor. You know, I, I didn't use that. I had one minute to talk about the bill. I just said, I lifted up volume one of four volumes of 2,990 pages, and I said, you know, the Democrats are defending this bill on 10 pages. Pre-existing conditions, capitation of accounts, no pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. And I held them up. Here's the 10 pages. And I said, but what about, and this is only 600 pages, what about the $500 billion in cuts to Medicare? Mm -hmm. What about the $500 billion in tax increases? What about the six years of benefits for 10 years of cost? And what about the, the develop of a whole new entitlement program called the CLASS Act, which is an un, uh, another entitlement program, which is a major reason why we have our national debt. The American people got really weary of this health care debate uh, all through, first while it was being debated, and then afterwards because it continued to get debated, and then there, of course it was the election. Um, do you think they can bear going through this for years and years again if, if it gets repealed and we have to rewrite and redebate this whole thing? Uh, well, I don't think there's any really individual who believes that the bill through the legislative process will be repealed you know, in this Congress. The question is, uh, will it be continue to be debated? And then it, in a presidential race, will health care be debated? And will that be part of a presidential race? And then if the Republicans take over? Yeah. I mean, uh, will they get wearied of it? Well, you know, if they get wearied about it, then they can throw us out. Yeah, know? yeah. Here, uh, let me put the historical. You've had a great observer for, for many, many years. Never, never in my now 15 years. And I think historically, I think the health care law was passed 10 months ago. Never have you had such a major piece of legislation that in 10 months had more votes to repeal than you had mm -hmm. votes to, to pass it in the House of Representatives. And it's, in, I think the founding fathers would be very, very pleased with the American public who rose up, changed Congress to repeal this law. And that's what we did, at least from the House side. There's other activities going on in the House as well, and these these uh, many of the of your colleagues got elected because they were going to uh, back spending cuts, and in fact, uh, Jim Jordan, the representative from Ohio, is heading up a work study committee, uh, which is calling for immense cuts. In fact, going back to 2008 spending levels. Um, are you are you on board? You bet. I mean, immense cuts from 2008 spending levels. That means everything but the stimulus. Pretty much. Well, the, the, the stim he, he wants to return the $45 billion that's unspent back to well, the Well, and, and he's right. The, uh, but, but, but people say 2008, it's, it's like we didn't spend money in 2008. It's like 2008, we spent a boatload of money. So 2008 spending levels is spending a lot of money. It's not, it's not spending nothing. So uh, we have a $13.5 trillion national debt. Most economists will say it's unsustainable. Communist China holds most of that debt. You know, he's here now. What if he calls on, on that debt that they hold? We, uh, uh, the people who sent us to Washington said, get your fiscal house in order. Uh, get back to some constitutional principles that will justify the spending or not. And I, I'll give you an example. I, I ran and lost, you know, for the chairmanship of the Energy and Commerce Committee. And, and one of the things that I highlighted in my presentation, I said, here's a, a, a provision in the Clean Air Act in 92 that was authorized for two years at $10 million. We passed it in the spending bill, not authorized for $250 million this last budgetary process. It's that type of scrutiny that we need to do to get our fiscal house back in order. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, Paul Ryan is going to be heading up the Budget Committee in the House. Very knowledgeable guy. I think everybody considers him. They may not agree with him, but I think everybody considers him very knowledgeable. He's going to incorporate a lot of this study material, I assume, in the budget. Does it have a chance? Well, you know, the, the, the public has a, 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 
a, an, an appreciation of what a budget should be, and that's not what we do. Now, I think what the Paul Ryan issue is, we've given him authority to do rescissions, which I think that's where, uh, at least from the House side. But when we pass a budget, it's not a document signed into law. It's a guideline to deal with the appropriation. The real fight's going to be in the appropriators and, and mm -hmm. actually some of the rescissions. I think that more issue is going to be on the rescission debate than on the budget. Um, but from the House side, you're going to see a very uh, tight budget and guidelines. Spending and hawks. You're going to be We've hawks. already, in the last two weeks, uh, you know, we did 5% cut uh, of our budgets, $35 million. Now, people would say, oh, that's nothing. But in Southern Illinois, $35 million is, is it's still is, real money. It's still real money. So <laughs> we're trying to lead by example, and, and, and uh, we're gonna, we, this is why we were put back into power. The census was taken last year. The results are going to come out soon. The House Democrat, the House, uh, uh, Illinois House Democrats and senators and governor are going to redistrict this state. Everybody says we're going to lose a congressional seat. There are now 19. They say they're going to have 18. You are number 19. Are you worried at all? What, what goes on? <laughs> when you find out, let me know. <laughs> I, you know, usually in, in the two cycles that I've been able to observe, you've had two parties who have been able to be at the, at the table, and you could have a governor who could veto it or, or Pate Phillip was in the president of the Senate, and then you could, you know, you could, it takes two to tangle. Right. Well, there's no tangling. I mean, no. so we don't have a lot of say. Yeah. Um, you know, it's going to be uh, Speaker Madigan and President Senate, uh, President of the Senate, and and, and and they can. Does it make you nervous though? No. As Listen. as you know, you're you're down there in yeah. this corner of the state. Of course, you you've got one of these snaky districts, yeah. but you're down there, and and uh, you're like I say, you're number nineteen. Listen, you I, know, I, out of eighteen. I've had the best job that I could have ever dreamed of ever as a, as a lower middle class boy from Collins, Illinois to be able to serve in the halls of Congress and, and fight for values and issues. Uh, uh, what redistricting give us, uh, redistricting can take away. Mm -hmm. I think part of my success was redistricting in 92. When whatever happened, they drew this 20th district down to the Metro East area. Had they not done that, I may have never even right. considered it. So. Uh, Listen, I... You'll worry about that when it happens. I could never happens. have asked for okay. a, a better ability to, to do public service than what I've had. So whatever happens, happens. Let's talk about, uh, if we have time, a couple of people. Um, Gabrielle Giffords. Yep. Do you know her? I do. Most of us call her Gabby. She's a Blue Dog uh, Democrat. She usually hangs out in the center aisle. That's usually where I hang out. I don't serve with her on a committee, but that's kind mm -hmm. of I know her from voting together and reaching over and casting votes because the machines are right there. So, But have I broken bread with her, you know, in, in that type of relationship? No, but do I know her? Yeah. Yeah. What's your impression of her? Well, she, I mean, I think all the news articles and reports about her are, are, are right on. Uh, she always has a smile, um, cheerful, uh, a sincere policy maker, but, but never mean, vindictive. You, mm -hmm. you would never see her lose control. You would never see her walk out on the speech of the president or something like that. You, <laughs> you would never see it as crazy as that. Yeah, yeah. But, a, little, uh, a little self, uh, a little self recrimination there. Um, <laughs> what about, uh, let's talk about John Boehner a little bit. Not too many people know much about John yeah. Boehner. He's, uh, he, he labored in the background a lot. He was a leader, but a very quiet leader. He's still kind of a quiet leader, isn't he? You know, I, I think, um, Central Southern Illinois uh, regular folks would really like this guy. Um, he comes from a large family of 11 kids. His dad ran a bar. Uh, he, he cleaned tables and swept floors. Uh, he just wants us to do the job through an open process, deliberative. Um, he's very conservative, but he doesn't push that agenda publicly. And I think that's where he's been able to develop a lot of support because he's not abrasive, uh, very sincere. Um, uh, I, I think he's doing a great job so far. Does he have the ability to keep, th there are a lot of ambitious people in the House. And, really? Yeah, and, 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 I, and, and, and you, I wouldn't say you lack ambition, but, but you're not driving, driving, driving right, all the time right. to get yourself to the right. top of the heap. Uh, but there are those who do that. Right. Can he keep them together? Well, I think his biggest, his biggest challenge is these 87 new freshman members, many of them who have not had legislative 
uh, experience and trying to make sure they have to understand we have to govern um, and we have to deal with the budgets. Uh, you haven't asked about the debt ceiling. That's the, the yeah. big monster coming. And hey, and we, hey, we got two minutes. Let's talk about it. <laughs> really? Right. No, really, well, this spring, there's yeah. a big decision to it, make. It's here. a big vote. Um, and you have presidential candidates say, don't support it. A lot of these folks ran not to do it. Uh, I remember stories about members who've done it many, many years ago. And I'm not sure they, they, they now would have raised the debt ceiling again, even when President Bush, 41, told them they had to do it. So uh, I think the jury's still out. It does give us the opportunity to reform the budgetary process mm -hmm. or pass a, a Constitution and Balanced Budget Amendment. Have you made up your mind where you stand on it yet? Uh, I should probably say yes, but uh, I think all of us are struggling. Where, where, how are you leaning? Uh, I probably should say yes, but all of us are struggling. <laughs> <laughs> so you haven't you haven't finalized your no, decision? No, I mean I haven't cast my vote, and it may yeah. be one of those when you're doing it. I I think be, I'll probably be a yes, but boy, a lot of us. Uh, you mean yes to extend to it. extend it? Yeah. But but we really going to see some bona fide addendums, at least a, an op opportunity to, to to vote for a balanced budget amendment or a major rescission package. Um, Illinois screwed up by this tax increase. The public wants to see spending reductions before revenue raisers, and we have to do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, Congressman Shimkus, congratulations on your eighth term. <laughs> Good luck, and uh, it won't be anything real new to you, but I, I think it'll be more pleasurable for you than it has than the last four years have been. They've You'll been be a to... long four years, yeah, so uh, yeah. hopefully we can at least get back to some center in this country. Thank you for joining us. Come back, Thank won't you? I will come back. Okay. And thank you for joining us on Lawmakers. We'll see you next time. Lawmakers is brought to you in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you.